Hello, good evening, and welcome to Science Fiction Snob. Today we're going to talk about Robert A. Heinlein, the Grandmaster of Science Fiction, his life, and some of his works. So let's start out with his life. So uh, Heinlein was born in uh, 1907. Uh, he died in 1988. Um, as a young man, he w he attended Annapolis, the uh, U.S. Naval Academy, 1929, and uh, no of note, uh, excuse me, he graduated in 1929, and he of note, he served in 1931 on the USS Lexington, which was a uh, new aircraft carrier at the time. Uh, he served under this uh, captain, uh, his name escapes me at the moment, um, but uh, often his, uh, this captain was quite famous, and often, uh, later on in his life, he was, um, he'd be interviewed, and he would be uh, specifically interviewed to be asked about what it was like serving under uh, this captain so it's kind of funny to uh, see a guy you know he's quite famous I mean if I if I had to meet Heinlein I don't know what I would ask him I'd be uh, I'd be so uh, starstruck so to speak but uh, you know he wasn't people weren't starstruck back then they were more starstruck with the uh, the, the captain uh, oh here it is Ernest J. King, uh, who later, uh, Admiral King later served as Chief of Naval Operations and Commander-in-Chief U.S. Fleet during World War II. So yeah, quite a, uh, quite a famous uh, captain, uh, U.S. Naval officer. So um, why is Heinlein important? Important. He, uh, he was the writer that brought. Um, science fiction from the pulp ghetto and into the mainstream. So before uh, Heinlein, you know, these uh, various, there was various science fiction um, magazines where people uh, wrote uh, short stories, like I mentioned with Asimov, but it was kind of, it wasn't considered mainstream. These were, you know, sort of out of the way, crazy science fiction stuff. Nobody paid attention to it too much, but he brought it into the mainstream, into mainstream magazines. So, um, that's his that's his big i mean he's got a number of uh things that he gave to science fiction but he was the first one to break out of the science fiction magazine ghetto um his novels are also noted for uh, at the time uh many novels were uh, novels or stories were very space opera-ish you know uh, buck rogers in space uh, which are basically westerns with uh with spaceships um however he used it he used science fiction to um look at uh, social issues and talk about social issues and that is that is probably my personal biggest um, drawing into science fiction is where we take you know some sort of piece of technology um, look at how you know teleportation or space flight or anything that you can think of and examine how that would affect our lives as humans how would it change our society I find that the most interesting uh, part of science fiction and you know to be honest if you uh, watch this if you uh, follow this channel for any amount of time you'll see that uh, I'm most intrigued by uh, stories that have some sort of very interesting uh, take on social issues or how uh, some something some piece of technology would affect our society um, different societies that kind of stuff I find that most interesting so um, some of the themes so uh, from space opera to social issues and some of the themes he um, he examined were politics and uh, sexuality so um, Heinlein was a he was a free love guy uh, back when it was not definitely was not uh, fashionable to be one. So um, I believe he had an open relationship with his second wife anyway. I'm not sure about his third and final wife, but um, he had an open relationship with her, and um, you can see uh, you can see in his writing there's a, a lot of. Uh, um, examination of human sexuality so you'll see that in the Lazarus long series um, a little bit in the moon is a harsh mistress though it's not that's not primarily part of it but um, you know he had these interesting ideas of you know uh, free love and how we shouldn't be jealous uh, and he put them into his novels uh, quite a bit so he's known main fo mainly for um, 
three sort of main his novels kind of fall under three main uh, headings as for um, how they fit into his universe. So his is ju juvenile science fiction um, series, which is um, really where I got into science fiction. I cannot remember which one it was, whether it was Space Cadet or um, uh, I'm not sure which of the uh, which novel I read um, back the, uh, back then that really got me into science fiction but it was like it was either space cadet or i think it was a uh, citizen of the sky or no or maybe no not have space will travel that was my first exposure to science fiction really when i was younger now um it was really asimov's um foundation uh, series that got me into science fiction my parents gave it to me for my for uh, christmas i think it was 15 14 or 15 and uh, it was one of my Christmas presents. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Uh, science fiction, never heard, you know, never had heard of Asimov. Just had read, like I said, read one or two of Heinlein's early uh, juvenile novels. And I read it, and I loved uh, Foundation. And uh, that, was what's got me, that is what got me into science fiction. So I, I, I you know, Heinlein's my first, uh, first science fiction novel, but Asimov is my first really get me into it and after that I was gone and I was reading science fiction almost nothing else so uh, his, he's got his juvenile science fiction novels uh, he has his uh, future history novels uh, which kind of all f um, fall under the same sort of uh, they kind of fit together very loosely in a world um, and uh, he's got in some of his novels, um, especially uh, I think his Revolt in uh, 2100, he has a chart and he has uh, where each novel covers, how much time it covers and where it fits into his his uh, series. But we'll talk about that when we talk about the books and Revolt in 2100. Um, and lastly is his Lazarus Long series. So that this, that has uh, Lazarus uh, that we'll talk about that as well later, but uh, briefly, Lazarus Long is the oldest man in the uh, oldest human in the universe. He lives, um, he uh, is very long lived, and then at some point in the future, uh, you know, they develop treatments, uh, anti aging treatments, so he, he lives much longer. And uh, there's a bunch of novels which uh, revolve around him and, you know, him going into the, traveling into the past at one point, and his family, and uh, various uh, things like, like, like that. Um, Stuff like uh, "Time Enough for Love" is the is the main one, um, but also the number of the beast uh, they fit into the Lazarus Long uh, thing. So um, he, he's not Hanlon is not necessarily really for the faint of heart. Uh, there's a little bit of unusual, uh, you know, incest and the free love and uh, very very libertarian uh, philosophy, especially in the moon is a harsh mistress uh, but we'll talk about those a little bit later but lastly I want to talk about some of the words that he has added to our uh, lexicon uh, through his novels so some of the uh, so he uh, he coined he coined the term moon bat to uh, to um, describe uh, left-leaning uh, crazies in the political spectrum spectrum um, I remember you know, Moonbat from 20 years ago, very used very often. Not used as much uh, now. It's mainly the SJW type stuff. But uh, he coined the term. Um, he also the term Waldo, which is a um, you know using uh, some sort of uh, you know putting on a pair of gloves and using them to manipulate some other uh, uh, robotic arms somewhere, whether they be you know very big and able to lift heavy things or very small and doing microsurgery that sort of stuff he coined the term waldos to describe them um uh, grok from i hope i'm pronouncing that right from a stranger in a strange land which is the story of a martian a uh, human who lives on mars and comes back to earth so to grok is to know something so well that is to almost become a part of it um uh, also, the term uh, speculative fiction, which he uh, he coined that to describe his his type of uh, social science fiction, which dis which um, um, 
you know, discussed social issues and, and, and brought those to light as to separate it from uh, pop science fiction, which was, you know, very, uh, you know, bubblegummy sort of uh, space opera, spaceships and laser beams and pew pew and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and lastly, so one of my favorite words, uh, tan staff all, uh, which is uh, there ain't no such a thing as a free lunch, which is very... Um, big in the libertarian community I'd say and uh, very deep in uh, the moon is a harsh mistress and just makes the point that nothing is free and uh, if you get something free for free you're paying for it in some other way let's move on to the novels so let's talk about Starship Troopers my choice for best science fiction novel of all time so published in 1959 Starship Troopers was written as a response to um, Eisenhower uh, unilaterally deciding to stop um, nuclear testing. Um, the Soviets then, um, you know, continued to test and, and caught up a little bit to the uh, Americans uh, in that area. So uh, Heinlein was, even though being very uh, liberal, and as I spoke earlier, he was into free love and all that stuff, very much a sort of a left-wing liberal type of thing. I, I think Highland was liberal, um, was socially very liberal, but he was a um, huge anti-communist, and he saw the Soviet Union for the danger that it was and was very much against them. So this book is actually written um, kind of like a piece of propaganda, um, written in response to um, that decision and trying to say that, hey, we need to keep, um, you know, you need to keep a strong defense. But uh, also the book is also very critical of American society at that time with the themes of uh, moral decay and implying that uh, what the way that society is going is going to lead to a uh, collapse of democracy. Um, I think it's a it's an awesome theme, and I think it's still relevant uh, now. And if anything, um, you know, since ni the 1950s, uh, when there was concerns of that, I mean, uh, if Highland was alive, he would probably say everything that I thought was true is carrying on. It might be going a little slower than I thought but it's still on track for uh, Western society to collapse. So that would, I would love to have, if he was alive, he'd love to talk to him about that and, and see what he thought about that. So um, Starship Troopers was unusual in that it, uh, sorry, let's go back a little bit. It's, it's a coming-of-age story. Let's give a quick synopsis. Coming-of-age story, uh, Juan Johnny Rico is... Um, you know, graduates high school and joins the uh, military. So um, he comes from a generation of non-military members, and his family is relatively quite rich um, compared to uh, you know others in his high school. So he kind of joins as a um, well, he joins because of a girl, really. Um, but uh, also, you know, it's a bit of rebellion against his father. Uh, as well, but again, it's mainly um, because of a girl. So, um, who who she wants to join, and she wants to become a um, a pilot. So, uh, in the society, this is set about seven hundred years in the future. Um, basically, if you want to be a citizen and have the right to vote, then you have to join the military and and serve for at least one term. Now, um, if you don't, don't join the military, you can, uh, you still have all the rights of a citizen, but you um, do not have the right to vote uh, for public office or run for public office. So the whole theory of the, the, the social theory of the novel is that um, the reason for our decay in society is that people who can vote are not responsible. Um, and you're not responsible if you are not willing to place your welfare um, below the welfare of everyone else. Um, sometimes some say that below the welfare of the state, uh, but it's not really the state; it's the collective. 
So, uh, you know, his criticism is that, you know, there's a bunch of people that can vote now that um, they simply, they have, they don't, they're not um, morally mature. They don't care for anyone but themselves, and therefore they will vote for whoever will tell them, will give them the most stuff. And that is a recipe for disaster as more and more people decide that, hey, I can get free stuff the government will take it from other people if I just vote for these guys, then um, that's what they'll do. So, um, you know, this is not a theory that um, is ignored nowadays. You know, this is mentioned in political circles. And, you know, uh, take American society, for example, half of um, Americans don't, you know, almost half of Americans, 47%, I think it was, uh, don't pay taxes. So, I mean, you're getting a situation where half of society uh, doesn't have to pay for anything, and therefore, you know, will they vote for them? They're basically uh, free riders. Will they get more stuff? So this is, uh, you know, goes into uh, Heinlein's libertarian uh, philosophy as well, though there's not a lot of libertarianism in there. It's more of, uh, you know, you'll see it. There's a lot of that in, in Muzahar's mistress, mistress. So... Um, this book has been called uh, fascist um, and was, you know, highly criticized when it came out. Um, I, you know, there are some, you know, the whole pro-military um, and having to join the military, the military as the highest uh, thing in society. Uh, I mean, that is kind of fascist, but um, I honestly don't think that, um, you know, it's a fascist book. He didn't definitely didn't write it that way. He was making a comment on where uh, our society was going, uh, the decadence uh, that was hu that was concerned concerning in the 1950s, which has, if anything, has gotten worse. Um, and uh, you know, uh, the the society in the book uses the military as a way to show that you um, you can put others before yourself. Right, so if you can, you know, what do we have? What's the only thing that we have as individuals is our lives. If we're willing to risk our lives for others, that shows that you can think of something greater than yourself. You're more, you're a more mature person, and you're, uh, w you are willing to be, uh, you are then can be a citizen. Um, the interesting thing about, uh, you know, it focuses on the military, and the critics talk about the military that that way, and say. You know, oh, it's fascist, etc. But um, Heinlein states in the book when he's talking about being a um, a citizen, he states that you have to serve a term. A term is usually two years, um, and if you um, you cannot be refused if you want to join the military. It doesn't matter how um, stupid you are, how unfit, how um, how uh, you know, incompetent, disabled, uh, it doesn't matter your race or gender, anything. If you want to join, you, they have to let you in. Now, they get to choose what you do, and you can be, you could spend your term cleaning toilets, but at the end of that turn, ter time, it doesn't matter. You know, you have uh, joined an organization, the military, that where, you know, you could be killed in its service, and whether you're cleaning server, you're cleaning toilets, flying spaceships, or you know an infantryman, you know, killing the enemies of uh, of the state, um, you've served your term, you've taken that risk, and therefore you get the full rights of citizenship. Now, and conversely, at any time, I mean, they can, they'll put you through a lot of, they might put you through hell, but if you can survive it, you survive it. And at any uh, the con as well, uh, at any time in the society, you can quit. You can say, "I'm it. That's it. I'm done," and you're done. Uh, you, now, you, if you quit, you forfeit citizenship, and you never get the chance to be a citizen again. Uh, but um, you know, the society is is painted as fairly rich and very, uh, you know, very content, somewhat, um, y you know, utopian. Some people call it a dystopia because of this. Um, this fascist element to it, but in reality, it's a utopia. The society is, you know, very little violence uh, in it. You know, as I said, people are rich. Um, they seem relatively happy. Um, bec you know, overall, a um, a positive. It's a very positive view. 
um, another element of the society that um, isn't is pushed uh, is the um, is corporal punishment so there's a you know it's a it's a bit of a throwback to nowadays you know children are spanked um, there is the death penalty for uh, serious crimes like murder rape kidnapping um, all those things so um, and it, but Highland paints it as you know these things are very rare um, you know you don't have many murderers you don't have a lot of violence in society, society uh, because people are more mature so very interesting in that um, aspects of it. So let me talk a little bit more about the the, the structure of the of the book. So, as I said, it was a coming. It's a coming of age story of Johnny Rico. It was primarily, you know, his his uh, you know high school and a little bit of high school, and then his time as service in the military. So that is inter interspaced with um, with a uh, with discussions. In high school, in a class that you have to take, um, moral and philo philosophical, uh, I can't remember the name, moral and philosoph philosophical something. Anyway, so he's got a teacher who's uh, ex-military and, uh, you know, is uh, is uh, handicapped from, you know, is missing arms, you know, an arm or a leg or something like that from uh, service in the military. Um, you know, it's the high tech. They've got all these fancy uh, prosthetic devices, so you know, you can almost not tell. Um, and uh, everybody has to take this class in um, in high school, and you got to pass it. But uh, there's really no grades. It's just a matter of if the teacher thinks you pass because you know you show up to class and engage in discussion. So in that in that uh, class, the teacher uh, basically. Um, challenges the students with uh, various theories. Why not do this? Why not do that? You know, corporal punishment is bad. You know, we shouldn't do it. Or he takes the reverse if a, if a student takes that. And they discuss all these things. And um, Heinlein uses it as a way to espouse his um, his philosophy that uh, is found throughout the book. So there's that aspect of it. Very interesting. The other aspect is is the combat scenes and. Johnny's training that he goes through. Now, this book has been praised because of um, of the the attention to detail uh, for that and the description of it and the very realistic description of all those sort of things. So, um, I mean, that's funny, interesting because you know Highland it focuses on the you know far future infantry. Johnny Rico is an infantry sol sol soldier, but. Um, um, you know, uh, Heinlein was actually in the Navy, so I'm not sure how he knows so much about uh, the infantry, but it's a pretty good job. Um, so uh, this book is considered the first piece of um, hard science fiction or military science fiction. So let's just quickly define those. Um, hard science fiction is science fiction that, that focuses a lot more on um, the science aspects of it. It's not like, oh, and then we get into the teleporter and we go somewhere. Um, a hard science fiction novel will talk about how that teleporter might work and uh, that sort of thing. Um, some There are a number of hard science fiction uh, authors that we'll, go, we'll, we'll talk about later, and I'll point them out. But I think Larry Niven would be considered one. He is, uh, you know, he... he I believe he was a uh, physicist or something. So the guys who are, uh, you know, have PhDs in uh, the hard sciences tend to be a little more uh, hard science fiction. Uh, this is also um, that aspect of military science fiction in that there's, you know, the combat aspect of it, uh, though not as much as a a pure um, science fiction writer, which would, who would be considered a military science fiction writer, which such as uh, David Drake great example of a military sci-fi writer. Uh, David Drake's stuff is all, you know, a lot of it fighting and combat and stuff. Um, he was a he was a Vietnam vet, so he writes that uh, like that. Uh, but we'll talk about him later when we get to him. So uh, those are the aspects of the book. Um, as I said, my choice for greatest science fiction book of all time, I 100% recommend that you have to read it. Now, uh, there was a movie released in 1997, Starship Troopers. Um, you might say, oh, well, I'll just watch the movie. Don't watch the movie. Um, 
it is you know it is only tangibly related to the book um the book is you know a thousand times better so let me talk about the movie for a little bit so uh let's see it movie's score on rotten tomatoes is something like 63 percent something like that um yeah 63 percent and you know i don't know that it even deserves that much here let me read a critic critic consensus consensus a fun movie if you can accept the excessive gore and wooden acting and that pretty much uh, um, defines it so the best thing about the movie is um, uh, the best thing about the movie it it shows the um, you know it sh- talks about it follows the general structure of the book and you know follows Dorico it's got a lot of violence in it and that those aspects of it um, it doesn't do well with uh, one of the things about Starship Troopers is it defines the idea of um, military uh, armor uh, enhancing your combat ability through, you know, uh, power-assisted armor. And, you know, the U.S. military is working on that, and you can Google that stuff. They've got some, you know, close to the beginnings of what, you know, it might become. Um, the f- movie doesn't follow that, but it does follow the, the sort of the violence and the uh, that aspect of it. Um, it, uh, you know, the director, um, uh, Verhoeven, you know, is an action guy, but the rumor is that he had for a long time wanted to make some movie about, um, about, uh, Nazis, Nazi youth during the war, uh, or something like that. So, um, he'd been shopping this movie around and, and nobody wanted it. Um, so he saw a way to sort of push that into Starship Troopers. And there is some, as I said, there is some fascist elements to it. But, you know, he um, pushed the fascist element. If you look at the actor's um, uh, clothing and that sort of thing, it's very, it's, you know, very Nazi-ish. You know, it's great that way. It shows that aspect of it. Now, um... You know, he doesn't talk. I mean, this is an action movie. He doesn't talk about the um, the moral uh, and philosophical aspects to it. So that is all lost in the movie, and um, so you're really missing out on you know a key piece of the movie. Um, I I don't um, you know I, if you want to watch the movie, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, it's not a like I said, it's not a bad movie, um, but it's not the book. And you know, if you were to uh, you know watch the movie and uh, you know write a book report based on it, <laughs> you would fail. Uh, you'd miss the whole uh, the main aspects of the movie. So best part of the movie for me, I guess, is probably uh, Denise Richards. I had a thing for her when I was younger. Um, she's a bit crazy now. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think you'd want to date her, but, um, you know, she's in the movie and she's hot. So, um, you know, back in the days when she was still, uh, young and, uh, you know, hadn't used so many drugs and been, and been married to so many, uh, rock stars. But anyway, um, you know, check out the movie, give it a try. Um, don't look, f- you're not going to get the deep philosophical aspects, uh, that is, um, from the, uh, movie and you won't get the focus on the armor because I guess they didn't have the uh, budget for it but it you know I think it kind of captures the spirit of, of the uh, the um, the people uh, they've the book has been um, criticized for being racist against you know the the aliens the bugs they're called um, you know the the society is very much you know focused on itself and and in that uh, you know uh, alien societies or other or the bugs or others um you know are not us um and they will just as you know if they're trying to wipe us out we will just as you know we will try to wipe them out as well um interestingly in the book there are you know the first battle scene if i remember correctly the first scene is against um the main battle is against um what they call the bugs but there's another society that they fight first. They call them the Skinnies, and they are sort of allies as the, uh, with the Bugs. And they, after um, the uh, mobile infantry attacks uh, them,
them, they switch sides. So it's not like it's just, you know, there are other societies, and even though the humans are, are you know, at war with the skinnies, at, sort of at one point, you know, it's not like they're, uh, humans are not genocidal. They're not trying to wipe out all life. They're simply, you know, attacking this enemy that, you know, attacked them first or threatens them. So uh, very interesting. Again, um, <clears throat> highly recommended the book. You have to read it. Uh, it's the basis for, uh, you know, Heinlein affected so many other writers, and this book specifically, um, you know, basically started the uh, the idea of soldiers wearing powered armor. Um, and you, and whenever you see that in science fiction, you know, John Steckley's Armor, which we'll talk about in the future. I I love that book too. Um, you know, he took that from Highland set that up for everybody. He took that from Highland and everywhere you see power armor in future uh, in any science fiction stories written after this um, it's basically people read Highland and they thought wow what a great idea and they've done their own take on it. Alright so that's Starship Troopers. I hope you'll give it a try. Let's look at our next novel. <laughs>